talk about walking infrastructure. Okay, so for the most part, um, we can actually find different like sidewalk standards. So let's see, we got American standards. I think we also have one from Singapore. And we also have our own. So our the the ones in the building codes are like a bit smaller than comfortable. So we have let's see, six feet. Uh, feet two meters. So one point eight. I think in the building code it's only one point five, or sometimes I think one point two even. Building code. So, do, 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 do. Oh, too far. Mm -hmm. Sidewalks over here. Let's see. That's ah, lagging. Oh. Upper sidewalk pavement, lower sidewalk pavement. Driveway. Curb configure. Okay. Obstructions on sidewalks. No, 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 no. Sidewalks. Drivers entrances and exits. I hear. So it's 1.2, just a little bit less than um, the American 1.8. And I think there's something here for um, Singapore. I like using Singapore because it's one of the sort of most developed countries in uh, Asia. And you see height of covered walkways, what about width of covered walkways? All commercial developments are mixed commercial urban design requirements, urban design requirements, 10% of our standard development control parameters. And we found on the urban design website. Okay, so they have a website for this downtown core. Oh, it depends on the area. So let's say I'm not really familiar with the locations in uh, Singapore. Let's say downtown. And let's see. Downtown core planning area. Where are the guides? Jewish Prime Office. CBD, do, 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 City Hall. Building height, building massing and form. Let's see, building edge, building typology, public space. Privately owned public space. Okay, there we go. And next, media version. Okay, well, that's downloading. I'm guessing it's also around 1.8, maybe, maybe even 1.5. Okay, here we go. Minimum width for covered walkways are three, 3.6 or five, depending on the category of the road they front on to. And let's see, it's just covered walkways. Downtown planning areas plan pedestrian friendly, comprehensive pedestrian network at the first story and basement and second story. The next time, people. Bicycle. 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 Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. Three pyramid. internal clear width of walkways are 2.4, 3.0, and 4.4, respectively. So it's even bigger than the US standard. So if you just take a look, you can just go Google Maps Singapore and go to an urban area. Mm -hmm. Let's say here in the center. Let's look for like a commercial looking building. Hmm, this the kind of looks like mall. Let's take a look at their street level. And look at that. That's definitely not three meters, but if you go inside, let's see here. Notice the large, ah, oh, it's even more. It's like a covered walkway over here. Let's go to the other side. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got handrails, we got 
Okay, so this would be the actual walkway here. So if you look at it, definitely more than almost like three meters. You can see that's one person there. And you can see people on, oh, that's just people were walking. I thought they were on like some kind of scooter. So you can see that's fire hydrant. Let's see signs and like uh, planter boxes or like the, what do they call this? Street trees and some sort of uh, protection for the street trees. Covered walkway. Looks like looks to be about almost 1.5 because it can fit two people walking next to each other, more or less. And then an extended sort of maybe like three meters like public sidewalk to fit their uh, street trees. So you don't see a lot of this in the Philippines, mostly because the code doesn't require commercial buildings to be designed like this. So this is really, uh, what do you guys think? You can mention in the chat box over there. Do you like this kind of design? Like uh, look at the generous sidewalks. Is it something you can fit into your design? Do you, what they call this? Uh, do you think we should have lesser sidewalks? I don't think anyone would say we need lesser sidewalks. And then one thing that I want to point out is you see you have like, um, railings here to separate the vehicles from the people also there's a sort of separate lane here different color from the actual road but this is more like um, urban design than uh, architecture but inside your property make sure you have like uh, your sidewalks are raised you have some railing you don't need to model this in but just something you need to keep in mind you need um, ramps if whenever you need to go down. That's why I would uh, advise a uh, raised crossing. So images over here, this one. So what are the advantages of a raised crossing? So let me open this new tab. So if you ever have a relative or if you know someone who needs a wheelchair to get around, or is uh, uh, any kind of PWD, raised crosswalks are very helpful to them, like for the blind and for those on wheelchairs. This means they can just continuously walk without having to go down. Because like if you're not going to use a raised sidewalk, they will, you will then, then you will need a ramp down here, and then they need to walk on the road, and they need to go ramp up again. So if you're in a wheelchair, you need to slow down, go down the road, and then you need to like forcefully put yourself, you need to put some effort into going up again. It's not a lot of effort, but it's still an inconvenience. It's not, it's not continuous. And then all the more for blind people, they need to like use their canes to check where the, the curb down starts. And they need to check like if they're on the right path going up again, and then they need to find the ramp and the the up ramp here with their canes again. So just very more difficult. So race crosswalk, not that much like expensive, like infrastructure wise. It's just like uh, X amount of concrete and pavement to like make that. But it's sort of like 10 times more convenient for people um, with disability. So they just go straight. And also it makes them more visible like for example, there's a person walking here, there's a person walking here. It raises them up, like so you can see them clearly if you're inside a vehicle over here. And I mean, that's my vehicle. So it's good for everyone. It's good for the people walking. It's good for the drivers who need to like see uh, if there are people crossing. And because it's raised, even if there's no one there, the car needs to slow down anyway. So it's much safer, much more efficient all around. So. Uh, do include race crosswalks in your um, designs. And the race crosswalks would also be a speed hump as well. So if you have your main entrance, really, really include a race crosswalks, uh, race crosswalk. And then also include like some, maybe you can just draw like a cylinder for your uh, bollards. Uh, this basically means that um, people with uh, hard, uh, who are uh, disabled, blind or like sight, uh, impaired, they can just knock their canes on the bullard, and that means that's the edge of the sidewalk, and they can continue walking. Also, uh, for not for those who are not completely blind, the bullards will also signify that that's the edge, and that will help them sort of uh, figure out where they are. 
Also notice that the landscaping is used to identify the raised crosswalk over here. So everything in this sort of design is beneficial for everyone. And also, uh, it's not just functionally sort of helps everyone, but also visually appealing. So instead of just a plain old sidewalk, um, which would, which is what we usually do in the Philippines, if, instead of just a sidewalk with a down ramp here, another sidewalk and down ramp there. So this is more sort of visually engaging and could actually be kind of could make your building or area look better. Okay, anything else from the, let's see, walking infrastructure. Ah, okay. I think you would also need to include some um, furniture, some street furniture as well in your design, if you can. Uh, I wouldn't require it. So think about like seats over here. Uh, if you're going to have commercial spaces or yeah, if you're going to have the concession spaces near like open areas like this, it might be a good idea to have some open air dining. So I think we can go to Vanilla Town Center for this. And uh, on center. Uh, let's see. I think they would have images of it somewhere. Ah, here there's a video of it actually. Okay, I think that's better. Ads. No, it's a two ads back to back. Okay, let's move forward a bit. So I really love these like walkthrough videos. So for example, uh, let me snip this like that. So we have a dim sum break over here. For example, if you have more space, you could put some outdoor dining areas here, some seats. And I think if we move forward, we can actually see that here. This is in front of the Bose coffee. So you have seats here. Uh, whether you want to model that or not, it's up to you. But you can just label it in the plan like uh, it's called al fresco dining, I think, or just outdoor dining. And really like fills up the space, um, makes it more like lived in. And that's just more commercial area or sellable area for your building. So you're, you're having more space for selling stuff, trading stuff. So the tenants are happy. And then your design will also look better as well. OK, uh, what else do we need to see here? Oh, also notice the minimum width. It's a bit small. It's about like maybe 1.5 or maybe about 2, 3. Maybe if you can go up to like 2.5, it would feel more kind of cozy or like more, more comfortable to walk in. But I think this is enough for Filipinos because we're a bit smaller than uh, or a lot smaller than Americans. But in Singapore, it's really surprising that their minimum sidewalks are a lot more than the US standard, like at uh, three meters even. OK, and also your uh, pedestrian ramps. So I think you already know the minimum sort of dimensions for a ramp. It's 1 is to 12, meaning the ramp, the, the rise of the ramp is a ratio of 1 to 12. So for every 1,000 meters, let me just, or one, 1 meter, 1,000 mm, you need a run of 12 meters. So this is what the ramp will look like. Like that. So that's the slope of the ramp. So this is, where is my dimensions? I'll just use it here. Some of you, this might be a reminder. That's good. I uh, just want to make sure that everyone knows this. Text side, text side, say 200. That's 1,000. And then if you have a sort of rise that's less than 1,000, you can just copy paste the same sort of angle. Uh, we can measure the angle like so. can make it about five degrees. 
but just copy pasting i guess you can you can also do that in revit i'm not sure um copy pasting the angle will make it easier for you if you just draw one ramp and then you subdivide it as you need let me need to charge my there we go for example if you have uh, less than one meter sort of rise just move that down here let's say you only have let's say 0.3 so you just do 0.3 offset and your ramp will be like this so the same angle but it's shorter because you only need to go up uh, 0.3 meters or 300 mm and then you need a what do you call this? You need a landing every six meters, I think. Let me open up uh, BP220 real quick. BP220 standards. Let's go through some images over here. Oh, not BP220, it's, um, what was the, uh, PWD part, PWD standard, and uh, Philippine PWDs. BP344, sorry. <laughs> okay, we have some images here. And see, every six meters, you need a landing. And the landing needs to be 1.5 meters in depth. I think the minimum width for the Let's see, I think there's a better image here somewhere. The minimum width for a ramp is about 1.2 or maybe 0.9. Let me see. Okay, 1.2. Let me double check. It is 1.2 here. And they have like a sort of landing area as well after the ramp that's 1.8 meters. And this is so the person in the wheelchair can maneuver left or right when they get to the bottom of the ramp. So this is applied, let me open this in a bigger image. So 1.8 sort of like uh, maneuvering area or turning area. So when they start at the ramp or when they get down here, they can turn left or right and also apply that up at the end of the ramp on top. So another 1.8 again. So it's 1.8, six meters, 1.5, six meters again, and another 1.8. Maximum gradient of 1.12, handrail sides at both 0.9 and 0.7 meters. So that's for grabbing at the lower level, 0 0.7. 0 0.9 is like for um, a person with a cane who is standing up. I will need that 0.9 sort of handrail. And I think there's a section drawing here of a person using it. So like this. Oh, no, they don't have handrails for that. Uh, let's see. Okay, you don't need to apply all of this in your design. This is something you just need to be aware of. So if, see, this is the problem with like ramp down. So instead of having one continuous path, they have to go down, turn, and then go forward to the crossing. Whereas if you have a raised crosswalk, all of this would be level. If I just draw it again. If you have a raised crosswalk, all of this would be the same level, and all the, all the person in the wheelchair needs to do is turn here and then continue to the path over there, like going down here, something like that. Oh, what else? Plants and shrubs. I think um, you don't need to like follow that. And if you have any questions, feel free to just ask your questions. Let's see, importance of the facade. Ah, okay. So this is where your previous assignment will come into play. Let's see. Uh, so there's still like one per, one or two people who did not submit. So let's check out uh, Lou over here. Let's see. So I asked you guys to give like, um, send me your like favorite buildings currently. So like uh, Lou over here sent the Die An Apartment by H.2. Oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Die An Apartment. H.2. Okay, here we go. 
So now that your building envelope is pretty much done already for most of you, now we can talk about the facade. So let's, uh, what is the most, uh, any, any mall will do, but let's talk about um, Lou's favorite building over here, the Diane Apartments. And in the chat or with your microphone, um, let's see. Tell me what is striking about this facade. What is uh, what is the thing that stands out? Uh, for Lou, I'll just read his answer over here. Let's see. Should be down here somewhere. Oh no, there's no description. Oh, I didn't ask for descriptions. Uh, maybe this one over here. Uh, is Lou present? Lou Henrik, are you here? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so uh, tell me what you like about this uh, this facade in particular. Uh, for now, sir, I like Kuang, like young extruding volume, sir. Like, mm -hmm. makes it more interesting, like rather so than the flat flat. Gold. Mm -hmm. So, okay, like, okay. yeah. Also, the, by the use of different shapes and also saying in interior, that's sir, mong naganahan ko for now currently. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, no problem. So let me see if I can get another view of the elevation over here. Ah, here. So you can see that extrusion, that push and pull <coughs> really makes it look <coughs> dynamic. I have no more water. <coughs> hmm. mm, let's see if we can find more views of this. Oh, we can just actually look for the address. Uh, <laughs> this is in Vietnam. Or I'll just put the city here. Very good to look at other Asian buildings. My voice is dying. Uh, maps. To get the Mm, need to get the water soon. Where is it? Oh no, there's so many. There's at the center uh, near the right, sir. Let's see. Lower than that, sir. There we go. Okay. No roads? No. Oh, I wanted to look at it on street level. Oh well. I think if I, if I just Google the name. You can find other images. Images. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll just stick with this one. An image new tab. Save image as. I think I just do this. Like so. All right. So what makes this facade interesting is really the masses that are like uh, sort of jumping out at you over here, over here, and I think also over here. And I think this part here is not part of the building. <laughs> That's a different like uh, group of buildings or like spaces. Okay. So one thing I really like to focus on is the sidewalk length here very generous almost like maybe like three meters maybe like 2.5 and then notice that even here in the spaces that are not like jutting out at you this also designed there's a sort of squares here a combination of squares and rectangles to give a pattern to the mass inside or the, the mass that's like just flat and then really the importance of your building facade is to create a memorable image or just a, an image or like a visual sort of, um, this, uh, well, again, I don't wanna use the word design, but something memorable that makes your building sort of stand out. And for commercial buildings, and I think also apartments, as we can see here, this is very advantageous because it's also a marketing tool so you can, uh, owners or clients always want a way, especially for commercial buildings, want their building to stand out so they can advertise it, they can get people to buy whatever they're selling. In apartments, it's buying room space or like <clears throat> it's buying apartments. 
for commercial buildings, it's getting people to visit your commercial building, do some shopping, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go through another uh, sample over here. I'll just go randomly. Let's see. So this one is actually close to a mall. So this is a hotel, I think. This is the Royal Park uh, Park Royal Hotel. So it's in, in Singapore. So I think we have a 3D view of this. Hotel. <laughs> Images. Or let's go to maps. Oh, let's start with the image first. So this is a good image over here. Let's go to maps. One interesting about interesting thing about this building is like the very huge sort of arcade level at the ground floor. So turn around here. Look at these columns. They're like three stories high. So on the ground level, it looks like you're looking up into I don't know what is that like a recessed like an upside down topography map. So that's a very striking sort of uh, uh, image or visual cue. So whenever you see this, uh, immediately you'll think of, um, I don't think any other building uh, in Singapore does this, immediately you think of uh, Park Royal Hotel. I wonder if we can go inside here. Uh, yes, we can. So you can tell that this space here, or this row of building, oh, where did I go? You can tell that this side of the building is the main facade. This is the side that they want to like show off. And we can't walk inside the building, but, um, hmm, why is it blurred? You can tell that this is what they want to show off. And the reason why they didn't leave it plain is they want to create an impression and make their building or their space uh, memorable. So we're often very much occupied with just the face of the building. But like, um, since this is a one-story structure, we can really focus on both the face and the street level because it's only one story. Um, if you zoom out, they're also designing not so much the canning the glass areas here, but you can really tell the emphasis is more down here, it's a street level. So in your malls, um, your facade is a lot simpler because you only have one level. So really to try to create a memorable sort of like walking area. What's weak in BTC is that it's very bare bones. Like they have their seating areas here, but the, let me call this. But the surfaces, like the planes over here, this plane here, the walls. So you have basically in um, architecture, you have four surfaces. You have the ceiling, that's one. You have the walls, that's two. You have your floor, that's three. And maybe another, if you're in a hallway, that's another wall over here. So try to, try to think about how you will model or like how you will mold or shape these surfaces. So in... Um, in the Diane apartments, they focused on the uh, second and third floor, uh, basically all the floors um, there. So the second and third are have this like extruding masses. On the ground floor, it's more simple, more simple, more quiet. But also notice that the ground floor surface or like the wall has like uh, several sort of empty spaces or voids to let light in. So if you see here, it's not actually a solid wall, but it's kind of louvers lang or kind of uh, railings or gratings. And then they have their plants there. And I think that's to allow more natural ventilation in because like Vietnam has a similar climate to us. And the advantage of setting it up like this is you can block um, afternoon sun um, with the walls here, the upper walls over here, and then you can allow ventilation to come in down here. So it's like, you don't need air conditioning, you just have natural ventilation. And then when you go up, you're greeted with this like uh, push-pull sort of effect where some of the rooms are pushing out and some of the other rooms are just like retaining flat. So it creates contrast and then that contrast creates a uh, visual interest. In um, Royal Park over here, the same sort of contrast is achieved by having different layers of, I guess you would call ceilings or maybe kind of to create this like topographic effect. 
So imagine walking through here, you look up, it's like different shapes, different colors, and it almost looks kind of uh, natural because like, if you think of topographic maps, they try to represent like um, land forms or like how land is actually done or drawn. So it creates a very interesting sort of uh, walking area. Meanwhile, BTC is just flat, probably because they couldn't afford it. But for this design uh, design project, you don't have like a budget. So if it's really all up to your like time management skills, how much effort you can put into the sort of the walls, the ceilings, and the floor of your building. And sort of these are just like big ways you can do it. Like you can have a three-story sort of column. Probably we won't do that because you only have a two-story building at most. So maybe something like this would be more applicable. So you're playing around with the um, the massing of the walls. Uh, also, how much walls you need, the texture of those walls, the colors of those walls, you can play around with that. I think we can uh, look at one more example. Let's say, do, 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 do. let's look at Neil. OK. I think I'll remember Neil as the that one student who uh, made the entrance arch. OK, so Neil's example here is very out of <laughs> very out there. So very sculptural and like organic, similar to Royal Park. You have that sort of contour going on in the inside. So maybe in your malls, uh, for example, uh, hey, now na focus on with any Neil. So I'll go back to his massing over here. Let's see, Neil, 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 Neil. Okay, I think I need my tablet for this. Hang on. Just make room for my drawing tablet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe for Neil's sort of uh, design, like this is just a suggestion. I'm sure he has his own uh, plans for the interior of his building. But for the purposes of our discussion, like how you can apply your like favorite buildings and favorite designs into your supermarket. Maybe you can do something like this. Ah, loading. Let me close this. I think we're done with that. We don't need this anymore. Uh, no. I think I'll keep my AutoCAD open for now. New. Uh, let's go with that one. Yep. And then let's. Oh, my throat is dying. Let me save this. Sample plan. Let's say 19 September. Okay. Snip. Sample design. Okay. Mm -hmm. Import. I don't know, just like drag and drop. Okay, it's one sort of plan over there, and that's like one sample design over here. Okay. So one of the best things about uh, okay, there we go in architecture is really there's several ways or there's really no limit as to how you can design anything. It's really just up to your imagination how you can create spaces and create sort of volumes and massing. So for example, let me just move this. I think I need to image canvas size. Need a little bit more space down here. We get 20. There we go. Oh. So seeing Neil's design over here, I'll just use a red pen. Am I connected? Why is it? OK, there we go. So seeing Neil's design over here, what was that? So the building kind of looks like 
just gonna do a quick, there's a like protrusion over here. Like already the building has a very unique shape. Like so. And then this is the commercial area. So you could have your supermarket here. Oh, supermarket nowhere else. So this is only one store. So I need to like shorten it. Like that, maybe. OK. So it's still amassing right now, but you will need sort of a walkway area. It's still a bit too tall, something like that. So there will be people walking along this area here. It's about three meters. And then he'll have his entrance arch somewhere over here. The, the angled thing so the entrance arch is somewhere over here and then since the entrance arch is kind of like that shape and then we have sort of this kind of pattern you could copy that pattern onto your ceiling for example like this is your ceiling area over here I have to just like extend so you have like a ceiling area over there and you can apply this pattern here into your ceiling if you want to <clears throat> onto there and then you can have your <laughs> I'm sorry my voice is dying you can have your mall spaces or your kind of entrances sort of like following that pattern if you want so that you don't just have a flat surface although some of you might want a flat surface it really depends like on your design sort of a direction where you want to bring your building and then let me see here maybe you can have some windows or maybe some copy the same sort of pattern over here like a jagged pattern so in you can have different patterns over here to open up your building whatever something like that and then let's say let's look at a different combination let's look at andre over here and look at andre's work uh, over here do, 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 do. so andre has a simple rectangular building and his favorite building oh it makes sense it's le corbusier <laughs> le corbusier's uh, unit the habitation okay so for this it's a lot simpler but it's also effective um one thing you need to note about the uh, unit the habitation is that it has a very interesting ground floor sort of um, space. The uh, pilotis, as they're called uh, over here. I think we have a good view of it somewhere uh, here. Oops. over here so the whole building is resting on these like um um wide columns ish i guess i think i need a better view called the pilotis and they look like this on the inside that is what i'm trying to to show so this is basically used as like parking space, but also gathering space. But it looks very bare, uh, but that was the trend at the time. So the key thing that I want to take out, I want you guys to take away from this because it's also a design space. It's not just kind of simple columns. The There was a reason behind the shape of these like, columns over here. I don't know, I can't remember what. I think you need to ask Sir Carl. And I think these are, these things over here also have a purpose. Like these things here, I think they're like vents or maybe some kind of windows or something. But from what I remember, um, Le Corbusier wanted this space down here so people could like gather here and also like uh, park their vehicles. If you see in the other image, you can see some motorcycles parking over here. And if you look at the whole building, uh, let's say building section. 
section. Okay, like so. I think there's a better section somewhere here. I may read this one. Yeah. Open image a new tab. Uh, I think I can just screenshot this for so it's faster. So if you look at the whole building, these are living spaces up here. And the idea was that uh, from what I remember, Le Corbusier wanted a common space. I think these are these spaces here on the upper floors and also the ground floor. So you have like a sort of a roof deck area here. And I think these are the hallways, although not a lot of people usually want to like uh, hang out in hallways. So he added a roof garden here or like roof deck and also sort of opened up the ground floor over here. That was like his whole design philosophy. I think you can also see this in the Villa Savoy. So even though it looks very kind of um, bare, I think that the idea here is that it's bare so that people could fill in what they want. And now it's used as a museum, I think. If it's still, is it still like apartments? It looks like it still is apartments because you can see some, um, some people hanging CDs here. You have some uh, motorcycles over here. But the whole, uh, the whole point is that it's designed in a way to accommodate a certain function. So the challenge here is in your mall, um, as much as possible, um, try to design every inch of your mall, every like square meter of your mall. So that is, even if it's like one story long, that will still take a lot of time. So that challenge really there is like, how do you manage your time? So you can include some design elements inside your building, something like that. OK. I think that's all I have for uh, building facades. Maybe we can look at, oh, wait, we're supposed to look at one more building over here. Uh, okay. So let me zoom out. Let me save this. For some reason, I can't zoom out anymore. Canvas is not letting me. So I'll just go to my uh, mall preliminaries. This is Andre. Is it Andre or Andre? <laughs> Let's see. It's Neil Tagimo Cruz. Okay. Let's take a screenshot of this. Also, uh, it's basically a rectangle. So let's make a new one down here. So if your building is essentially a rectangle, the advantage to that is you can make it anything you want because you're not limited by weird angles. The disadvantage of having angles like this, you're kind of like set in that the building will have angles. So you need to treat it in a way that would fit these angles. Having a sort of a plain block will give you much more room to sort of design uh, in a way now you're not hampered by the building mass. So if you have a simple rectangle, it's ba basically a blank canvas. It's the advantage of having a simple rectangle. And then you can apply your uh, motifs. So for example, uh, this is Andre's design over here. Uh, let me go back to the floor plan. The entrance is up here, you have an entrance here, an entrance here, and then you have an entrance here. So one thing we really want to stress for our malls is a canopy in your entrance. So I just want to en enhance the canopy over here, maybe following that sort of rock pattern. Because uh, I don't know if that's what uh, Neil is going to go for. It's up to Neil, and it's just like suggestions. So let's see. That's the main entrance over there. So let's say like a Unité de Habitation sort of inspired entrance. So maybe we can have something like that. And then we can sort of copy the pilotis maybe like so for the main entrance, something like that. And you can do that again over here. And you can have like some pilotis looking things over there. And then let me see. I think we can apply these windows here. So depending on where the spaces are in your supermarket, you could probably have the windows all over your building, like so. How is the roof treated in the unit? See, it's a simple, it's a simple sort of parapet. So maybe we can add like a parapet over there. 
parapet over there. And then you can have your walls like that. And maybe you can change the widths. Is it a constant width for the windows? Oh, it's a constant width, but there are different colors on the inside that makes it like pop out. So different windows. And then you can have your sort of different colors like so. Like one could be yellow and the other could be sort of blue. So you have a Unité de Habitation sort of mall. <laughs> and you really can't go wrong by referencing already good architectural work. And that's a cool thing about being an architecture student. You get so much reference already, so many existing work that you can quote unquote copy. But if you contextualize it, or like if you consider the climate of the Philippines, that's why we have um, very long sort of canopies over here, very long canopies over here, then you can modify whatever you're referencing to create something new. So uh, you're not exactly copying, you're referencing. So something like that. And then that's your design. You already have um, a way more interesting mall than BTC, SM, or even Ayala. So the advantage of having a sort of a simple sort of building footprint, it gives you more room to design um, this week because we're doing the preliminary design. And for a sort of angular building like this, uh, it looks good in plan, but the challenge is how do you make that look good in 3D? So this is what I mean about uh, th thinking in 3D and like, thinking about the facade, how your building will look like from several angles and not just the top or the side because we're making a three-dimensional work, so you have to think about it in 3D. <laughs> okay, so let's see here. Anything else I need to discuss? Also, what was my lesson plan again? I forgot. Okay, combining plants and elevations. Okay, so we talked about the entrance arch and material finish. So I think we're also doing that here. Uh, most of you don't have elevations yet, but I think one student uh, already started. Let's see. So we have some, what do you call this? Standout students here. Ah, okay. I think this is one as well. So this is uh, Montemayor. I really like the trees in the site dev over here. So we have some sample elevations. So this is sample elevation. You see the, it's a bit far away from the building. It's a bit covered by trees, but that's okay. It's still a preliminary sort of perspective. So her idea, if it, it will load, yeah, it's also very heavy. So try to avoid, oh, it's only 1KB. Why is it lagging? Yeah, something wrong with my, maybe I have too many things open. I'll just close my AutoCAD. Oh, so much information, even though it's only on one MB. Maybe it's because, because my Adobe is just weird. Let me just close that. Cancel, cancel. Oh, it's not responding. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see here. Uh, Montemayor's work. Uh, let me go down here. Canvas size. Let's add another. 30 inches down there. So her idea is you have the building mass like this. And then you have her sort of like louver surrounding the building. Uh, let me change another color. So a bunch of louvers. Surrounding the building like so. So uh, if Montemayor is here, are you here? Um, forget, what's the first name? Uh, yes, sir, I'm here. Ah, yes, okay. So what is the sort of uh, reasoning behind the scanning louvers in front of your building? Uh, mainly for shading, sir. And I also want no kanang create a sense of privacy like mm. so it will be like yeah. glass here behind yeah but i'm not yet sure with it but sir i'm still ah, okay to, yeah okay so uh where did you uh get this idea from um the research was uh, arch daily sir and 
I saw a building mm. na it made use of louvers. Or, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember the name of the yes, building? Yes, sir. Wait. Okay, send the link. So we'll take a look at that building. For some reason, my my PDF is lagging like crazy. Uh, why is this happening? Think na na shy si kwan Adobe PDF reader. Come on. Okay, there we go. Don't know why it's so laggy. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so. Hopefully that loads in a bit, but you can already see that um, Leon already designed the interior, grocery selling area. So the warehouse is on the right side of the screen and sort of the shopping area is on the left side. And I think the plan here is to have everything sort of opened up. And then that's why the louvers are here. Okay, um, let me see. Ah, it's really not loading, I don't know why. Yeah, every time I try to move the PDF, it freezes. Anyway, let's take a look at your sample. Okay, should be much better. I think I'll close these other windows too. Okay, so Danfa Community Hall. So let's go through their images. So one thing that really stands out to me here is that it's open space. And is your grocery area going to be like uh, open air? But Kanang not air conditioned. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. So open air in mong grocery yes. area. And also make concessions. Ah. Like so. Okay, good. Because so I was worried if you're going to do it air conditioned, then there won't, there's really no point to having these louvers here. <laughs> okay, so open air, that's good. That's very interesting. And then we can see sort of, I'm trying to find a view here. This would have been a good fit for Cologne as well. Uh, so this is the existing mall or like community hall and they renovated it to look like this. Ah, okay, okay. It's a very good, uh, nice, this one. So you can see the louvers is there at two levels and it should provide plenty of shade for the interior space. Looks really good. Okay. Looking at the elevations over here. So the whole structure is two levels. Trying to find a section. Will they have the 3D image over here? So I guess it's the ground floor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, construction work. I hope the microphone is not picking that up. Ah, oh, my PDF is frozen. Okay, never mind. Close that. <laughs> okay, so this is gonna be open space, uh, like open air. I mean, so I think one way to sort of um, I can't load it here, so I'll just load it in Canvas. Let's see, Montemayor, here. <laughs> okay, so it loads fine on Canvas. So I think one thing that would be sort of uh, good to add, um, let's see, where is your main entrance? Is here, is it here? Uh, Whoa, it's going crazy. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what is this here? Wall lang siguro, sir. I'm not yet sure. It's ah, wall lang customer service, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I think it would be good to move your entrance like uh, here. Because it's kind of... Let me go back to your site. Oh, it's very far away from the thing. Okay, that's why your entrance is there. Um, Let's see. Sort of to make it more obvious now that's the entrance 
uh, over here and not this one over here. Let me just make that. So this one is your exit. And then I don't know why Canvas is so finicky. And this one is your main entrance. OK, so one issue here would be the main entrance doesn't look like a main entrance. Why does it keep moving? <laughs> Okay, that's why I keep using the snip tools much faster. So maybe you could add sort of like a canopy, maybe like extrude the wall a little bit. And um, this massing over here, it's a bit distracting and it's used for uh, customer service area. So I don't think you need that much. So maybe you can just reduce that because um, if you go back to 3D here, whenever there's a sort of a, what the heck, oh, I'm on brush. Oh, sorry, I'm using the erase tool on my pen. Whenever there's a sort of a jutting space or a space that like pops out, most people will be naturally attracted to that. Like, oh, there's something coming out here, so maybe that's the entrance. And the issue with like having a big wall here is this wall becomes a point of interest and not, no longer your main entrance. So maybe unless you have like a very kind of big window or like door over there, uh, then it could work maybe. But I think much better if can have your main entrance extruded, maybe something like that, with a big sort of uh, door over there, and then your louvers would follow as well. They will also be extruded like that. So must obvious and a main entrance. So um, this is what we mean by I mean actually by uh, thinking in three D. So making your main entrances pop out, or like literally having them push towards your uh, visitors will make it more kind of obvious or like, a, uh, what's the word? More effective as an entrance. Let's see over here, nothing. Um, I think also you need like some kind of entrance or exit over here. And that is in relation to our next topic, uh, Where's my thing? Um, oh no, that's for more for fireproofing, but uh, we can discuss that in a bit. I think we'll skip our resilience for now. So let's look at fireproofing standards for the Philippines. I think I have my fire. Uh, yeah, something else will pop out with fireproof. Uh, Pokemon. Ooh, ooh. Ooh, fire code, ah, fire code. Should have it here. King 14. Nope, building laws. May I have it in my drive? Full drive. I think I close this. Oh, BP or uh, is it PD 940? W design, plumbing, condo, fire code of the Philippines. Okay. And then we have uh, sort of minimum distance towards exits. Oops. Let's see. General authority. Let's see. Authority. Organization of fire brigades, training, assistance support, safety enforcers, and the fire safety evaluation and inspection, fire safety measures, classification of occupancy, general hazard, means of egress, page 51. Um, how many people have this fire code? 51, 51, oh, too much. 
Do, do, do. 50. Okay. So means of egress for both new and existing buildings shall comply with this division, except as may be modified or for individual occupancies by Division 8 through 17 of this chapter. Let's see, for, let's see, when an exit is required to be protected by separation from other, I don't know, okay, we don't need that. Board and care, sprinkled, and triggered all of it. Capacity factors, ramps, occupant load. See, minimum width, number, ah, here. Uh, number of means of egress, meaning exit, from any balcony, mezzanine, story, or portion and all, thereof shall not be less than two, except when uh, specifically determined in Division 8, blah, blah, blah. And then let's see here. When the occupant load of any story or portion thereof is more than 500, but not more than 1,000, the means of exit shall not be, shall not let, shall, huh, shall not be less than three. Anyway, so that means we need more than one sort of entrance and exit. So in this layout over here, you only have one entrance and exit like that. I think I'll just draw on top of it because canvas is being weird. So for this plan here, you only have one entrance, one exit. So you'll need another entrance and exit. So maybe somewhere in the middle. So in case a fire breaks out here or here or here, um, if it breaks out in the middle, they can just use this entrance here. If it um, breaks out somewhere near the front, they can use an entrance or exit here. So I think for this small, it's easy to say that we can have um, how many square meters? This is like 2,000 square meters, if I remember correctly. Let's say about uh, 2,000 divided by, let's say 1.5 square meter per person. So it's very easily can go up to 1,000 people in this area. So you'll need at least three entrance and exits or means of egress. So you have your entrance exit here. Then so maybe that's your big one. And then you'll have smaller ones here maybe and here. So entrance exit, entrance exit. And that will impact your sort of building facade. So let me just delete these other things here, delete. So maybe your building will end up looking like you have your extrusion here for main entrance and exit, and then smaller openings here for other entrance and exits. So like so. So now your wall is not so flat, and you can have some like sort of uh, push and pull effect, like contrast, so that it's not it doesn't look uh, too monotonous. And there's also a functional reason why you need more entrances because of the building, uh, because of the fire code in the Philippines. Okay, then we have your concession spaces here. It looks pretty good. What other things do we need to consider? Sanitation, electrical, mechanical. Okay. So I'll just stay on Andres here because the, the floor plan is already there. Just move that a bit. So first and foremost, we have sanitation. So I don't think it's a requirement in our submissions to include the sanitation. Let me check. Let's see, design brief. Mechanical and utility diagrams. Okay, so we have mechanical here, escalator, escalators, refrigerator systems, etc. Oh, excuse me. I think I'm going to get a water for a second because my throat is really going now. Um, but where is that thing? Out ah, here. So first thing we need to look at is sanitation. I'll make that blue. So this just means like where is uh, uh, supply, water supply coming from, and then wastewater. So for this setup, you only need supply and waste in your, um, let's see, let's look for your toilets first. So we need toilets over here. So that needs both water supply and water waste. So wherever your source is, maybe like somewhere from the RROW, maybe somewhere here. 
Oops. Something like that. And I think your accounting office will have some toilets. Here's the toilets over here. All the offices, all the offices will have toilets. We have let me go back here. Let's see, canteen, employee, locker room, and restrooms. So that will need water supply and waste over here. And then I also Let's see your meat and poultry freezers, meat and storage, prep area, fish and food. So basically where there's frozen stuff, you also need um, some washing and some like drainage facilities. So maybe uh, here, 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 and also the storage areas. And the piping will probably go something like that. Following that wall down here and going to your water supply like that. Okay, and then there will be drainage. Uh, in the freezer areas or the wet areas, you notice that if you look over the counter where they sell meat and poultry, they usually have like a drainages over here. Like uh, this is the counter. For example, that's the counter. They're selling their products here. There's the person over the counter. And if you go behind the counter, there's usually some drainage uh, there. Okay. Now, when you freeze stuff, it, like, um, it's not frozen all the time. So sometimes things will get wet, so you'll need drainage over there. So the way drainage would work is um, usually it's separated from the supply lines by a couple of uh, maybe like centimeters or maybe a few meters even. But you can just draw it out like this. So wherever your pipes are, you usually want them to stick together. The way they're arranged is that uh, in section, so for example, um, this is the counter. Let me just erase that. For example, you have your um, meat display area like so. You have your person standing there. There have that display area. You're the shopper here. And then they would need some kind of lavatory somewhere. I think you've seen that in the fish area. They need a lavatory there. And they need a drainage here. So the water supply line would look like, uh, let's see. Mm, let's say, yeah, we need a wall. So the water supply line would usually be in the walls, maybe something like this, and it connects to your pipe like so. And it goes out like that. For the drainage, you need your pipe here, like a sort of a down pipe, and it maybe feeds somewhere into the wall like that, and it goes to your uh, waste. So waste, and then your supply. Okay, so that's about it for sanitation. Let me see. Okay, you also need to think about the uh, the, the roof drainage, but you can just like um, simplify that like with a roof drain. But we can we can handle that towards the final. Okay. Next issue here is the electrical. So for electrical diagrams, I don't think we need to make them because on the list here, it's just escalators and refrigeration systems. But let me just like review it, your basic utilities. So for electrical, it's not required in our submissions, but just like a quick review. So basically, electrical just showing your lighting fixtures, however you want to do them. I don't think we're doing it for this particular plate, but maybe for the next plate. So something like that. And for the actual construction drawings, you also need a power layout, but that will be done by the electrical engineer. Um, not much else for lighting. Next is we have the mechanical. Where is it? Right here. Do 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 do. Refrigeration system. So I think I'll just do a uh, Google for this. 
refrigeration. On meat. So let's see. <laughs> they usually look like this on the outside, and on the inside, I need a section here cold storage room. Mm -hmm. You can have something like that, and you can have something like a schematic. Very schematic will do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mall air conditioning system. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one. Okay, so we have the meat storage, simple sort of like blocky roof with a condensing unit over here, so left. Condensing unit here and an evaporator here, basically making sure the inside of this room is cold or like a certain amount of cold at all times. So they put their meats here, fish, whatever needs to be refrigerated. You have another design over here. So you can just draw it as a single room and then you can sort of label where the uh, condensing units and evaporators are. So just like these uh, sort of air conditioning units. I think you only need one per room, and they're going to be a bit big, as you can see here in the image. OK, and any questions on that, um, you just let me know. But this is like just the general idea. You don't need to specify the actual thing. You just need to make room for it. OK, there should be a bigger picture for this. Oh, they're all small. And for those who will, be have, air con who will have air conditioning in the whole mall, you can uh, refer to this. Ah, here we go. So we know that, uh, let's see, where's this? We know that Leon's floor plan here is supposed to be naturally ventilated, but for just the purposes of discussion, let's say this is an air conditioned sort of room or like an air conditioned mall. So when we show the mechanical, I'm not sure if we're going to include it with the refrigeration systems, but it's very easy to do. So you need a sort of cool air supply. Just think of it as cool air supply. And then sort of sucking out, um, let's say we call it exhaust. Exhaust or suction. So. Uh, the venting, <clears throat> the vent system will look like this. You have either like a centralized air conditioning system where you have a sort of cooling tower at the top floor or like at the top of your building, and you have several vents that would sort of be distributed throughout the spaces, and it blows out cool air and it sucks in warm air. And I think there's uh, other images for this. Uh, maybe this one. Oh, that's still the same image. Ah, this one is better. So this will be more useful for multi-story buildings, but the same principle can be applied to like a single-story building. So uh, let me make this bigger. So I'll put the supply in blue. So for example, this is your building footprint. And you're going to have sort of a we're not going to include the offices because it's just for the grocery area. So something like that. So maybe your main air conditioning units will be on the upper floor, let's say somewhere 
like uh, somewhere over here. Like I just draw them as boxes. And then they'll go down. And then you'll have, uh, maybe I'll make that broken lines instead. So you have your main sort of air conditioning units on, this, on the roof. And you have several sort of small kind of uh, cool air supplies. I think there's a minimum distance for this. You can see these in malls about maybe, let's say, two meters apart or something like that. Uh, let's see, centralized air conditioning unit. Central, centralized AC air conditioning system walls. And I think this is the closest we can get. <laughs> the actual CAD drawings or like construction drawings look like this. So you can see a bunch of ducting on top of each other. And but basically the principle is this: so you have your cooling towers at the ceiling or at the roof deck. You have your ducting, and then you have the um, sort of outflow opening and the intake opening. So in blue, these uh, openings are blowing out cold air, and then usually a bit close to them, like like this, you'll have a intake or like a suction. So maybe in between those uh, cool air supply, you'll have sort of hot air intake, maybe something like that. And the dimensions for this, you can just like round it off. I'm not a mechanical engineer, so maybe for this, you can have uh, 1.5 to 2 meters. And then this is just in between. And then the suction will just be in between the supply. And that's just based on my experience. but. Um, in actual, the engineer will tell you how much space they need. Okay, so that's uh, all the systems. Now we'll talk about <clears throat> um, earthquake proofing and typhoon proofing your building. So this is more on the structure. Uh, this is more for the, when you get your columns laid out, but I think you also need to get your columns laid out to make your elevations and sections. So I think you all know from the report already that let's start with uh, earthquake proof because it begins with the columns. As much as possible, you want regular column spacing. So for example, you have a building like this. Let's say this is, I think I'll do this in AutoCAD. Sample designs. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know the rule of thumb for um, columns, column layout, column sizes? Hello? Hello? Column layout and column sizes, does anyone know? Nanawaan ako mga students. Kwan, sir. But uh, what, what I know is minimum ang um, I for 300, 300 by 300 column kay minimum, uh, maximum 4 meters distance mm -hmm. from each other. So, mm -hmm. That's correct. That's close. So a quick rule of thumb would be for every sort of um, like, kato uh, 300 by 300 for four meters. So you can about say na for every 10 meters, you have about kanang one meter na column width or column dimensions. For example, you have this here, this width. Let me make the dimension bigger. So that's about 78,000. If you're gonna make only one set of columns at 70 meters, we're gonna get one very big, your, your columns are just gonna be on this side and this side. 
you would need uh, seven meter wide columns. So that's not ideal. So you divide it. So basically, if you have 10 meters distance, you need one meter in a column. So one is to 10 beta. So a bit lesser than that in actuality, because it's uh, for every 4,000, you only need 300 by 300. But a quick to simplify that, for every meter, you need about um for every meter you need uh 100 mm or something like that so how do i sort of illustrate that so this is 78 but you really don't want to make a 7000 by 7000 column something like that just takes up too much space. So your idea is you subdivide it into smaller bits. So let's say by 10. So if I divide that by 10, and let me explode this. Now you have a column sort of span, column spacing of, that's still 15, a bit too much. So maybe we'll go smaller. I divide by 12. 12. Let's say just 15. Yeah, I'm going to stick to 12, so it's not too small. OK. So now it's at. I wish I could have revised the standards for my dimensions. About six meters. So you would need about 0. 0.6 or maybe maybe even like 0. 0.5. So let me just draw that now. Point uh, six six hundred six hundred six hundred. You just need to find the center. So you can start out with having the column arranged by uh, according to its center. It's just, it's just more easier to arrange things this way. Like so. Oh, where is it? Like that. And of course, try to keep the same distance uh, going the other direction as well. So I'm going to offset by 6556. Five, and it's going to look, let's see, it's going to look like this. So the reason why we want our spacing to be regular is that makes the building stronger. Um, against earthquakes and any kind of sort of a movement on the on the ground because like more regular shapes means more consistent loading and irregular shapes means uh weaknesses at some like sort of corners so as discussed last week or like several weeks ago during the sort of resilience report simple shapes are better to resist to resist movements earthquakes um strong winds what have you so try to make your column spacing as consistent as possible. And then if you do need to like move some columns or, or like uh, delete columns, try to keep it like minimum long. Like maybe you need like a big entrance down here to remove a column over there. Maybe you need something else in here to remove a column over there. So try to uh, minimize that. Uh, let's see. So what will happen is you will have a you see like this. So you'll have a consistent sort of grid of columns, basically. And then you move your spaces around those columns. Actually, six meters might be a bit kind of small because you'll have sort of a big area like this. So you need to remove this column or move it around somewhere. It's also possible now. If you have a column in a sort of an important space, let's say, for example, this is like an important space here, 
Um, you could change the shape of the columns, like from square to circular, to be more sort of pleasing to anyone like walking around this space. Um, and then since this is just a one story structure, I don't think you have any pro any much problems with the, any problems with like typhoon or whatever. Uh, as long as it's gonna reinforce concrete and it's a steel truss with proper fastening, like for example, the 3D of this would be something like this. I'll just simplify it to like three columns, or maybe four. Okay, your sort of top beams here, and then you need your uh, foundations, of course. Just simplifying it. <laughs> uh, sometimes we don't use like a uh, sort of a uh, footing beams, but sometimes we do. Depends on like uh, what the engineer uh, suggests. And I think it's mostly dependent on the soil type. If it's soft soil, you need more uh, foundation work. Uh, but for this plate, you can just like um, uh, choose whatever you're more comfortable with or whatever your building tech teacher has taught you. And then I'll just review it. And then your roof structure goes on top like so. And the roof structure is really vulnerable to uh, strong winds. So how do you like sort of prepare for that is, uh, let's see here. As discussed in our article over here, closing that. <laughs> you need some, what do you call this, sort of lateral support roof bracing is what they call it so remember our roof truss is just a bunch of like that and then you need you can just draw in like something like that like roof bracings so going back here it basically just keeps the roof tied or like uh, connected to the um, structure below it so it doesn't fly off. And then the roof sort of uh, the GI sheets itself, as long as you just specify the minimum spacing of about 0.6 meters, uh, let's see here, 600 mm actually for like the, the fasteners, but you don't need to draw that out. You just need to know that um, there is a standard for uh, roof fastening and of course there are several materials for roof uh, sort of roof materials basically roof materials Philippines sorry my voice is like dying you have the corrugated sheets the GI a lot cheaper but also a lot sort of uh, thinner and lighter uh, without proper fastening it could literally be ripped off a building and then you also have the heavier sort of roof tiles, more expensive, but as a, because you're paying more, it's actually more durable. And because it's heavy, it doesn't get blown away um, in case of like uh, typhoons or whatever. Um, I think that's all of it. I think I need to stop here because my, <laughs> my throat is dying. But any questions so far? An image a new tag. Okay, steel trusses. I think it's that steel trusses are the standards in the Philippines, unless you're building like a smaller structure. And you see here now, um, they don't, they, they haven't applied the sort of a uh, roof bracings yet. But I think for this sort of configuration, it's kind of what they call this. Um, good. Ah, in terms of like roof type, that's good against typhoons. Uh, in the Philippines or like uh, generally, let me open this here. Ah, this is a good image. Didn't load properly. Hmm, 
I can actually make this an activity. Uh, modules, research, reader schematic, the, the revised plans. I'll put a small quiz here. Uh, it's not really like a quiz quiz, but just more like a participation thing. Roof type. This way I can record everyone's participation better. Uh, let me edit. Just have one question here. Roof type. Did I save the image? Uh, this is, I'll just put here, uh, essay. And I'll put the question here. Or an opinion, actually. Which type of roof do you think is best uh, suited? Uh, or which type of roof best resists strong winds? Okay, this is just for class participation. Patient. And do, 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 time limit, no time limit, multiple attempts, no multiple attempts. And save and publish. Okay, so everyone hop onto Canvas real quick and answer which type of roof do you think is best against like strong winds or typhoons mm -hmm. let me moderate this okay so you got people joining in so let's try to get as many people as we can just guess. You don't need to get the correct answer. Everyone will get the point. I just want people to participate. Because <laughs> my throat is dying. I just want to relax for a bit. OK, while you're answering that, I'm going to get a, a drink. Be right back. Okay, I think everyone should have an answers by now. <clears throat> you don't need to write a whole reason why. You can just like put the number in. So let me see. Oh, excuse me. Oh, my camera has been that high up this whole time. Uh, okay, 7.5 distance aware. Sorry, I missed that. <clears throat> okay, let me close this. Let's go to the roof types. Uh, no, the speed grader is what they want. Let's see. You got hip roof. Oh, <laughs> did I mention hip roof before? Yeah. So if you have, whenever you try to like Google like um, uh, roof uh, typhoon, I think I made a post about this before as well. Wait, it's over here. And do do do. 
Hi, sir. I'm in class. Okay. I think I made photos of it. The roof, 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 or is it? But yes, the answer is hip roof. And let me see. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Try to find it. Timeline photos. Why did they change this? Hip proof, hip proof, hip proof. Oh, I didn't put a JPEG for it, just a link. Hip roof or typhoons. Or hip roof, uh, IP resilience, IP emergency, roof design. Here we go. <clears throat> So what the UAP architects and basically the United Architects of the Philippines found is that hip roof is more resistant than any other roof type. And then you need to have at least 25 to 40. Um, other researchers I found suggest 25 to 30. And it's because the shape of the roof, oh, let's go right here, ah, sorry. It's because the hip roof sort of a, uh, it's very good at deflecting the forces of the wind like this because it's flat it's like angled here and angled here so whenever wind like a uh, sort of in any direction wind tends to go like that and then if you have a gable roof like a simple gable roof like this like that the wind tends to catch on this like surface area here so I'll make the wind red, tends to catch that and like pulls the roof off. And if you think like a flat roof would be better, um, the problem is when when you have a kind of flat roof, let's, let's say like, uh, I need a new sheet here, new. I'll just use paint for now. <laughs> it doesn't load so long. So let's say you have a flat roof like so. And usually when we do flat roof, we need to have like a parapet to hide like the flatness of the roof. These areas here and here, and also even the parapet itself um, catches the wind. And because the, the wind goes here, so it's like you draw a section of it like so, like that. These areas need to be reinforced, and these areas kind of act like kind of sails, so they catch the wind. Whereas the hip roof, like this, is very good at deflecting the wind, even though it catches here a bit. And basically, whenever you have longer sort of um, roof eaves, that's also a vulnerability. But in general, because of the shape of the hip roof, you don't have the sort of a kind of vulnerability here and here. And what other roof types are there? Let me go back to my question here. Let's see. Butterfly roof is worse because we have a butterfly roof like so. You're basically asking for the wind to take your roof away. So you have vulnerabilities here, vulnerabilities here. So because the butterfly roof is like facing upwards, it catches more wind. And let's see here. The other type of roof is shed roof. And you get the same sort of problem there. Shed roof like that. Vulnerabilities here. Oh, well, this is not as vulnerable. So again catches the wind let's see 
Dutch roof is a little bit better, but the Dutch roof, because the Dutch roof has an opening like this at the top of it, like that. So this area could also be catching wind. So uh, the engineers would really want uh, a more simple roof. Um, let's see, gab gambrel roof is kind of like the gable roof, dormer roof, basically the gable with windows on top. M-shape roof. Um, I think just the M-shape roof is not so bad, but it's basically just two gables. And really the issue for the Philippines is that we need, we need these overhangs here to provide shade to our spaces underneath it. So basically, how can you sort of reinforce that if you want to? Maybe you can have some columns here. And I think if you really want kanang to be extra safe, you just use heavier roof materials. So whatever design you end up with, it has the extra benefit of having the roof itself with like roof tiles or ceramic tiles be heavy so that doesn't get uh, blown away. Let's see, some other damages like GI. There's like an interesting roof shape that I'm working with um, Sir Ruel. Uh, where is it? Desktop. Uh, where did I save it? Is it projects? PCGS type. Let's see. So this is a, so you can see it's a curved roof. And if you think that might be kanang more wind resistant, uh, it's not. <laughs> so you can see the GI has sort of been torn torn off. And I think it's, I think this might work as well if you really want this shape. I think they didn't apply kanang um, sort of proper fastenings. The steel structure is fine. Uh, this is in Cebu, by the way. But because GI sheet is very thin, it just got like blown away. And I think they didn't do proper fastenings. Also, you see some wires here where the roof was fastened to. But yeah, um, curved roof might be decent. Again, it acts like a wing. So it might even, um, what they call this, be more vulnerable to strong wind. So um, another factor here is building height. So the taller your building, the more exposed it is to strong winds. It's a good thing that our supermarket is only one level, so it's less, less exposed. So notice here, um, the sort of guardhouse area, maybe it's repaired, maybe it's not. But if they didn't repair this, then more likely they also didn't repair this. So this survived, uh, mostly because it's on a low, uh, I would guess because it's on a, a lower elevation. So Basically, higher buildings or taller buildings have more exposure to strong winds. And I think that's it. So for earthquake, you need consistent column spacing. The consistent column spacing would also translate to more consistent like trusses. And then uh, for sort of roof shape, hip roof is advised for short, short buildings. For tall buildings, I really couldn't find any studies like what would be the ideal roof shape. And then if you want extra protection against typhoon, just use heavier roofing materials, not GI sheets, more ceramic tiles, especially because there's no like budget limit. And yeah, that's pretty much it for earthquake and typhoon resistance. And yeah, I think that's it. I promise to end at 11, it's already 11. And if you have any questions about your designs, we can do consultations until, I think what is our time? until today uh, calendar oh, no faculty load it's until 12 yeah so if you have any more questions i'll be online and but if you don't you can continue working on it remember for our preliminary designs you need um the floor plans the elevations oh dome Oh, that's a good question. Uh, dome, I'm not so sure if kanang, let's see. Uh, let's see. It depends on the type of dome, because you can have, let me open up paint again. You can have a building that looks like this. Oh, sorry. 
like that. And if this is one continuous structure, like the dome shape, then I think that would be very resistant. But if you have a building like this, where you have like the ground is there and then you do that, then I think that's pretty much the same as uh, the project me and Saruel are working on. Um, you still have vulnerabilities here and here. And if it's going to be, let's go to 3D. Uh, for example, if, if it's going to be like a perfect dome, so you have a circular base on top of your building, it might be good at resisting the wind, but you need to have reinforcements here where it connects to the building on the bottom. Like so, like this connection here, this connection here. And it's still making sure that it doesn't get picked up by the wind like that. Plus, um, I don't think that looks good on a supermarket. Yeah, usually you would have a long building, like so. And if you're going to do a dome shape, maybe it won't work. Um, so I think hip roof will be good. It's going to end up looking like that. Might be too tall, actually. Maybe something like that, like shorter. Uh, I forgot what that name is called, where you like cut it off like that. I forgot the name of this type of roof. Uh, maybe short hip. You can still like make it a simpler hip. And remember the minimum angle is about 25 to 30. So like from there, like 25 to 30, and you go something like that. Okay. And then if you really want, you can hide it with a parapet. I think it's fine, like so. So um, we won't grill you so much on the shape of the roof. We just need you to be aware, and like you need to put a short description. Why is that? The why is that roof shape the one you're using? And um, yeah, we'll do a bit more research if like there's some questions. But um, mostly for this project, we just want you to be aware that. All of these different design decisions have an impact on your building, uh, not just like how it functions, but also with like uh, typhoon and earthquake resistance. Okay, I think that's pretty much it. Pretty much it. Oh, sorry, I have a question. Jim. Yes, go ahead. Regarding so like if ever green facade or anything, but if it's, if it's it's like not more like planters, it's more like one laser. It's more like of a network. Yeah, or growth media lang. Do we have to like add like a dripping system or like pwede ra ka ng probably like natural for rain lang. Like for vines, okay, sir. Like vines or plant, mm -hmm. planters, okay, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, could you uh, show me your screen so I can like imagine it? It's hard uh, to. Okay, sir. Could you draw so, it? Like, back, sir? Ah, okay. I think that's fine in terms growth, of morning growth media, yeah, sir, along with soil. The yeah. plan mm -hmm. is like natural, okay, sir. You know, add a dripping system. Like, is mm -hmm. it okay, Rabbi, sir? I think this is okay in terms of like typhoon and wind resistance. Uh, the question is here how do you can help those plants grow without? Like, how, does someone need to, like, uh, I think someone needs to go up there and, like, water the plants every day or something to make it, to make sure that they stay alive and you don't have, like, a bare green wall. Mm -mm. But, like, mm -hmm. along with this growth media circle, like, naga siya mura green water system na mura mga siya, sir. Along with that, kay mura natural, kwan lang siya, sir, like, for watering, hindi na siya ka nang mag water water na dyan. Also using like the ivy thing and like the vines kay pradi kisha ingon na kanang heavy o kanang pag alaga sa plants. Okay, so I just need a diagram or a schematic to show me how the watering of the plants work or how often they need to get watered. Um, so it will be fine. Just need to explain how it works. 
Oh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Mm -hmm. So just attach like, um, so similar, I'll just share my screen here. So what do I mean by diagram? Um, Antawan. How do you mean like a detailed quantum sa system? Yeah, detail, not super good at detail, just like a drawing lang, 2022, issue one. Where's my issue one? Ah, there it is. So, duh, 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 duh. come on. That's over here. Full screen. It's so sad that we keep cramming too many images into our pages that we don't get to highlight the most important image. Like this is a very important detail, but it's hidden in the very small corner of the page. So where is it? Okay. So you can see here, now the panels are supported by framing and then you can see in this image here to the right, if you zoom in, you can see that these are actually sort of tiny, tiny like, what do you call that? It's not a pot, but it's kind of a plastic. It's hanging on the on the support of the cladding. And these are a lot of kind of several small plants, and they're just being constantly watered. There was a drawing um, here. Sir. Yep, go ahead. Actually, the amount of questions are like, it's like more like a green wall and a living wall okay like planters only use but like i'm doing the opposite like the green facade like the natural vine thing like one source lang siya, sir and this can number of planters para mag distribute the water system niya. Uh, yeah one source yeah but you need time to get the plants to grow unless you what they call this time right? unless you buy the plants they're fully grown already and you just put them onto the wall <laughs> Oh, okay okay sorry thank you yeah so like how is that being executed without i need some explanation on that but that's okay you can do it uh you just need to justify or show how it works i think there is yeah i think we don't have any other images but yeah so maybe something like this where you have like a detailed drawing where how the plants work how is it like hanging on the wall where does it get its water? Because like even if it's low maintenance, it still needs water. How do you pump water there? And um, stuff like that. I just need that uh, a short di a small diagram to explain what's going on there. Okay. Okay. There are no other questions. Um, take magmeet ming at. So, so well in a bit. I'll stop recording here.